The statistics are one out of 10 visually impaired people are employed. So the, may the odds ever be in your favor. What's up everyone? It's your favorite blind chick back on your screen with another one. You asked, so here it is, my working while blind story time. I got a lot to tell you, so grab a snack, grab a drink. There's been a lot of jobs I've worked in the last 11 years while being visually impaired and, and eventually legally blind. So I'm ready to share some laughs and some tears with you because there's a lot, so let's get into it. Let's put this away. This pineapple peach shake is thick with two C's. Let's get into this, let's proceed. Whew, there's a lot, where should I begin? Let's go back to 07. I was 19 working at Zara, but it wasn't until I was about 20, 21 that Ilanid and Vela, some of the best managers I've had, were accommodating. Honestly, they should host a course for some of the managers I'd meet along the way because some people need an accessibility 101. They just knew off rip, off jump, how to accommodate me. For someone who didn't want to accept it initially, it really meant a lot that they were willing to find ways around my eye disease before I even knew what I needed. I had these two managers be able to say, okay, don't do stock today or take your time rather, or maybe try this way. And that really helped me feel confident. I wasn't losing my vision and losing my job at the same time. That would come later. I worked at Zara. They were super accommodating, super strict still, but I loved it. From there, Zara to Casey's. So Casey's is a restaurant and for my American subbies, it's like the Applebee's. It's that kind of bar type of food where people go after the game or before a concert or movie. It was a type of place where people just had to tell you at the door, oh, we're just here because the place we wanted to go to is fully booked. Like, do you want your table or not? I don't know why you have to share this, but there'd be 80 people at the door sometimes or zero. It was just all or none. And because we were so close to where the Raptors games were or Taylor Swift concerts, it was just always an influx of all these people demanding a table, very high, fast paced energy. It was a good introduction into the restaurant world, but I hated it. For six months, I hated it. But one thing I learned that relates to this story is the persistence of people to continuously tell you what you should do. There was a couple of people, one hostess in particular, anytime I was the hunchback of Notre Dame over the books trying to figure out what was going to happen next, she'd always say, you need stronger glasses. I had just got these glasses. They were $1,200 and not because of fames or fancy. The prisms in the lenses were expensive. She always had to make comments about, why don't you get contacts, stronger lenses, or LASIK. Here's a Nobel Prize for knowing what I didn't know already. So annoying, but she might have been the first, but definitely not the last to be that persistent to tell me what to do about my vision loss. So from there, I didn't really want to share as much. So thanks to her, I didn't really want to tell anyone else about my eye disease. So I just kind of shriveled up. Not shriveled up, that sounds weird, but I kind of retreated. That sounds better. I started to work at a little store called Victoria's Secret. Back then, Victoria's Secret was it. There was no Savage X Fenty or Skims, it was just VS. And we hadn't had one here. The Yorkdale one maybe opened up two months before the one at Eaton Center. And I was so hyped to work there because it was five minutes away from my school so I could just do a quick shift before or after class and get a sick discount on lingeries. I was so excited to work there, so stressed when I was applying and filling out the form, like, don't be so obvious. They're gonna tell you you can't see what you're filling out. I had 20, 40 vision there, meaning that what you could see at 40 feet, I could see at 20. So I was doing a lot better than I'm doing now. I'm way past 2,400 now. I was just very self-conscious. I didn't wanna tell anyone. I didn't tell the managers. I made... Let's just say a couple customers got the Alicia discount and it wasn't intentional. Sometimes I thought I typed a zero after one because panties were usually 10 or $13, but I didn't, so they got it for $1. Sometimes I typed it and didn't realize I hit it twice and a few people came back saying, uh, I don't think this, this panty was $100. I realized when I made that mistake a few times, this can't happen anymore because they're so strict. Like if you clock in one minute late, that's committing time fraud committing time fraud. Isn't that serious? So I decided, especially the days that I would wear heels because the taller I was, the higher and further the distance from the screen to my eyes were, 
I would do a little bend and snap, <laughs> like Legally Blonde. I would wait until I bend down to pick up the bag before I package the things to say the price. That way my face was right by the screen. And that worked the entire time I was there. I made less mistakes and I was all good. I also learned the wonderful art of memory. I would memorize the price points and everyone would be like, oh my gosh, you're the best cashier. You're so quick, blah, blah, blah. Because I had already memorized what someone's total was. Someone drops down five panties and they're five for 30. I knew that was 33.90. Or something was 13.99, but now it was 10 and they were pairing with this. It's gonna be 45.50, like that type of stuff. It's just crazy that I still remember these after tax totals. So now when I shop and I zoom in and I see something 59.50, I'm like, that's not worth 67.80. It's kind of interesting that I still have that skill, but that's how I was able to work at Victoria's Secret as my vision diminished. From there, I got hired as a manager, the operative word, at an ice cream shop. And I quit Victoria's Secret because I was well over it. The ice cream shop, oh, just no, just no. From morning to night, I imagine scooping ice cream, making crepes, and dealing with a lot of like, ah. Anyway, the moral of the story for this part of my career life is I had to learn a lot of memorizing. When I was cashing out people or counting the till, I'd match up the change so I knew that the quarters, nickels, and dimes were what they were since I couldn't see them well anymore. The smallest one is 10 cents, then there's a medium sized one that's five, and the quarter is this big, that kind of stuff. And that helped me not make mistakes and not have my till be over or under when I had to do it at night. I memorized the buttons on the iPad, which doubled as the cash register. A few times I might have typed moose knuckles or tracks or whatever it was called instead of Rocky Road, but at the end of the day, there was no loss because we turned out the tubs based on what was sold physically instead of what was in the inventory on the iPad. So luckily I didn't lose out on that, but it was a lot of working by myself and a lot of feeling like I didn't go to school for this, what's wrong with me? And it wasn't good mentally for me to be there. So eventually, I left. It's very stressful working for a family owned business because you feel like everything you do weighs on the success of a company that impacts like people you know versus a big corporation. So I'm like, I'm off this. And by then I had already started working at a restaurant called Spice Root. And this place back in the day was lit. It was everything. It started off as a fine dining restaurant, then phased into the place where a lot of people, escorts would go to get a drink. And then there would be bottle service. And it was always like, you'd hear the latest hip hop, rap, top 40s. It was just, it was like getting paid to party basically. I love that hostessing experience 10 times more than working at Casey's. The only thing is I didn't really fit in. I caught the hostesses on several occasions when they didn't think I was there or could hear them making fun of me leaning into the screen or doing something different or weird and I hadn't told them I was visually impaired and especially after hearing them make fun of me, I wasn't going to. I didn't accept it in myself and for me to actually share why I was doing things the way I was, I didn't think it'd make a difference. The way I see it is be a good person regardless. Whether you know I'm visually impaired or not, you shouldn't be making fun of me. And I'd find myself crying sometimes because I didn't want to accept being blind. It wasn't even that they were making fun of me. It was that when they made fun of me, it was my moment to speak up but because I was so trapped in not wanting to be my disease, I couldn't relate. I was so detached from myself. It was, this is like the Marvel universe of blind girl stories because my other story time now comes and loops into this. If you watch that, you're gonna know what I mean. It was just a hot mess. Nearing the third year, I'm like, I have to get out. I've been out of school for two years now. I've applied to a million and one different jobs in my field and I've heard nothing, not a lick, crickets. So I'm like, you know what, let's pivot. Let's just apply to something completely different. And when I did, I got it. I got a job at a law office as a law clerk slash receptionist and everything was peachy for the first week. Six weeks later, I was let go. That's how the story goes. But what happened was I was making a lot of mistakes to the point where one time one of the lawyers called another lawyer into their office and was like, what the f is this? And I knew he was holding the affidavit I just crafted. So I quickly opened up the file on my little 13 inch laptop that I was training to see. And I realized, oh shit, there's a typo in the first sentence. But I couldn't see when I was typing and an autocorrect didn't help the girl out so they reprimanded me for that and a few other mistakes. Cuckoo. Then one of the other lawyers pulled me aside. He said, 
I know you can do better than this. Something about you tells me that you can do better than this. I broke down and I shared with him that I have Starburst disease and I thought that I could do this job really well, but obviously it's affecting me and I don't know what to do because the adaptive technology I had been shown wasn't helping with the job and the glasses weren't working anymore and I was just very high strung about the situation. So he's just like, take longer if you need. I know it's a very fast paced environment, but I'd rather you take longer with the files than put them back in the wrong place. So I did that and for a bit, I tried to build my confidence back, but it was shot. I was still in that place of not wanting to accept my diagnosis. So how can you adapt what you won't accept? And because of that, eventually it came to the point where they're like, sayonara, you gotta cut it. And they let me go. And that was that on that. I was devastated. I was out of work for I think almost two months, depressed. That was around my 25th birthday, so you can imagine how I was feeling. I think a couple weeks after that, my best friend at the time got me a job at Chibo. And Chibo is a sister restaurant of Spice Root. So she had worked with me at Spice. She got transferred to Chibo. And I wanted to work there because I'm like, at least I know hostessing like the back of my hand. I can memorize the reservations. I know how to use the software. This should be a cinch until I get a job in my field. I'm just going to be there for three months, three years later. <laughs> So I worked there for a bit and at first the RM, which used to be the GM at Spice Root, was like, what's going on? What's going on? Because I was so slow. I was having a hard time because I had a Samsung tablet and I didn't know how to zoom in. And then even when I figured it out, it was so hard to zoom in without affecting other things on the system that I was just, it was a mess. And then I had another manager who's like, how many hands am I holding up? How many fingers am I? I'm like, how about this one? After that rough patch, it was easier to get things done, but I was kind of over hostessing because I'm just like, this is not what I went to school for. I'm not knocking the retail or restaurant industry, but I did go to school to do something different, right? So I was applying, applying, applying. And then my friend let me know there was an opening at Beyond 330. And that's an after school program where I was a nutrition communicator, coordinator, not communicator. Essentially, I was a nutritionist at a middle school and what I would do for the year and a half that I was there is teach kids how to cook. The kids were so amazing. That was the best part of the job. Everything else I hated. You know me, I hate cooking. The only reason why I can cook so well is because of my little minions. We learned together, okay? I had to learn how to memorize what the oven was on or the stove was heated to for water or oil in the skillet without seeing it. I had to teach kids how to not cut their th thumbnail from experience. I used to cut it a lot because I couldn't see, but they were cutting because they were too eager to cut. A lot of times I get them to cut the onions and they cry. I'm such a savage, but you know, overall, it was a lot of good memories. I love those kids. They're grown now, so I hope they're good, whatever they're doing. But for me, it was a learning lesson on finding ways to adapt, at least for the lifestyle aspect. The admin, the admin, arena of things was a little tricky taking pictures of receipts so that I can send it so that they know that the funding is proper or when the ministry would come in to check things everything was like we're on pins and needles I learned a lot from that job I hated it but it was what it was and I had to quit because in the first half I was using my Chibo checks to buy the food because the budget was 80 cents a child a lot of them weren't getting food when they went home so it was a lot of pressure for me to make sure that they were eating healthily and also being full at the end of it because they wouldn't get food into the breakfast program in the morning. After a while, I couldn't do anymore. It was costing me financially and mentally, so I bowed out gracefully. After that, I was working at Chibo still, but I wasn't getting enough hours, so the manager decided to transfer me to Chibo Part 2. They had opened up a new location, the one I had worked at until the panorama pandemic started. And there I was not just a hostess, but also a wine angel. Sounds so fancy. Basically what a wine angel, wine fairy does is strap up in a harness, go up and grab wines. Now, how did I do that? Legally blind. I memorized, imagine memorizing 1300 bottles of wine. And sometimes they rotate out based on what sells, but I did it. I took my time. Thanks to Desiree, Yitz, Anthony, Claudio, Alessio, Fabio. They were also accommodating from talking to me about the wine so I would know what the notes were, how much it cost, so if a server asked, I could pull from memory and not from sight, to writing things large if I had to call back a reservation or a note or something. Like, they were just very quick on it. A few times they'd give me something to sign and I'd be like, uh, what does it say? And they'd be like, oh yeah. But 99% of the time, very accommodating, especially compared to some of the other places I worked at. Super understanding, I'm forever grateful because I've had a lot of nightmare stories 
as we get into present day, okay? So when I started the job that I have today, I've been working there for a year, minus six months, because I was off for six because of this stupid pandemic. For the first three months, it was a lot of telling every single person about Star Wars disease. I felt like I was the foundation fighting blindness, informing everybody about this eye disease. Clients would come in, why is your screen so big? People from head office would be like, oh, that's an interesting setup you have. And then I'd have to get into this whole story for five or 10 minutes about what Star Wars is, why I don't just wear glasses, da 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 da. Meanwhile, still trying to learn the system, be good enough at it that I'm not making mistakes. Then the world shut down. And I was actually relieved, but don't tell anybody. When I came back on, I did that job for a little bit, but then we went into lockdown again. So instead of letting me go, they were kind enough to give me other work in the administrative side of things. And eventually that led to me getting the role I have today, which is a lot of customer service still, but more admin related. And it's a hard balance. Sometimes I do a disservice to myself where it's like if I push myself this hard and I literally just can't see something, who is this helping or hurting? Because the job gets done either way. And I've been making a lot of mistakes lately so much that I was reprimanded last week. So it's a lot to talk about something you're currently processing versus the stuff in the past that I've already processed, if you know what I mean. I don't know, it's something I'm getting used to. My mistakes, sometimes I notice them a day later, a week later, or someone noticed them months down the road and it's just like, this is not good. So I'm trying to do my best to catch my own mistakes, like proofreading yourself, but how well can you proofread when you can barely see? Even with those three vertical screens, I would prefer one larger screen, but that's the best they can do for me. There's no legally blind friendly version. So I just use the Windows magnification, which hasn't gotten any better from that 13 inch laptop that I used at the law office. So it's just a matter of me trying to find ways to make it work for me, which as of late has become tricky. I can't even lie, but I try, I still try. Every day I just tell myself, maybe one day I won't be able to do this. So all I can do is my best. It's the comments, the people who say, ooh, it's so much for you to zoom in and zoom out. I wouldn't even work if I were you, but I don't have the option. I don't have a financial fallback. Like I don't have a family that's wealthy or a husband that can just support me. So I gotta do it. Plus why would I, if I had those both, I'd still be in this situation because I'm that type of person. I want to be independent. So it's really hard having people make these comments repeatedly or I know someone who's legally blind and they don't X, Y, and Z and it's just like, okay, what disease do they have? Or even if they have the same disease as me, it's represented differently. It just is what it is. So I don't know, guys. It's just one of those things where I'm grateful I have a job, especially considering our economic situation. There's no but. <laughs> I'm grateful as much as it's visually exhausting to stare at something because a lot of things I do is data entry. So I'm continuously entering the same thing, which makes it easier for me to miss something if you're doing something repeatedly for three hours. And I do go slower than I would like to because my brain works really fast, but I have to slow down so I make less mistakes. But sometimes it's still gonna happen. Things are gonna still fall through the crack. I'm still new at this role. I was promoted maybe a week after my dad passed away. So my head was not even in a place to absorb all the information every way. Anyway, and four months later, now I'm starting to get a grip of the things I learned from the first week, but it's hard. And it's, it's also hard when people make comments like, oh, but you edit your YouTube videos so well. Apples and oranges, you can't compare what I've been doing for literally a decade in my free time to something I need to get done within an hour on somebody else's time. Plus, I only learned this stuff four months ago. There's people who wouldn't even have bad vision that would make the mistakes I make just because they're new at the role or the type of work it is. But people don't wanna see it. And as much as I've been blindsided by my disease, I know a lot of people don't see eye to eye on what needs to happen for people as far as accessibility goes. And I put all those puns in there on purpose. <laughs> It's just been a journey and an adventure for me as much as it has been for a lot of the coworkers I've had or employers as well. The statistics are one out of 10 visually impaired people are employed. So may the odds ever be in your favor. Let me know where you're working down below and how it's going for you as well as your visual acuity. I should probably find out what mine is. I'd be amazed to kind of see what it is considering what I do every day. If you were like me and you were the type of person to feel like you were worthy or valuable because of what you could provide, this disease is gonna rock that, basically throw it out the window. 
And in a way, it's a good way to start fresh. Now, whenever someone's like, who are you? Or define yourself or tell me a little bit about yourself. I never start off by saying I work at a blah, 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 or I do this for a living because I'm not, I hate my jobs. So I'm not going to attach my identity to that. And I'm not my jobs. Even if I loved what I was doing, I wouldn't say I'm that because I'm not. I'm a person that likes to communicate. I believe in connection and community. I believe in being honest and authenticity. And I think these qualities transcend a job and are transferable to any job. And I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too esoteric with it. This is how I get on the pod. But if you're ever in a place where you feel like you're losing a sense of yourself because you're losing your vision, remind yourself that there's so many more elements to you that you have to offer and give the world and also give yourself. And I think it's going to help you along the way. Anyway, that's all I got for today. If you enjoyed this one, let me know by hitting the like button, share and subscribe. We're on the road to 20K by May. So let's do it. Let's get it. As always, thanks so much for hanging out with me. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.